Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Pain don't hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandry Lucchetti. And today we're talking about 1985's Legend. We assume if you're listening to the podcast, you've already watched the movie. All right, Sandro, give me a brief uh, brief idea of what you thought of this movie. I felt that this movie was a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And I think that that'll come through in, you know, my usual nitpicking. But mm-hmm. uh, ultimately, I'm just trying to figure out what sort of fever dream acid trip people this movie was made by and for. <laughs> <laughs> That's right what, what about you? Um, uh, torn a little bit. Um, it's a movie I haven't watched in a long time and I did watch it twice recently for the review. And, uh, honestly, I, I'm, I'm glad I chose to revisit it. I'm glad I chose it for this episode. I want to find out if you're glad because it changed your thoughts on it or if it reinforced them, but why don't we get into the actual movie first and then we'll get back to that. Cool, man. Um, so let's just jump right into the actual story. How about that? Sounds good. Um, in the the version I watched, which is the U.S. Uh, theatrical version, I believe is the same one you saw. Yeah, it's the one you told me to watch. <laughs> I, hey, I don't know what you do, man. I was hoping you did so it would be on the same page. But with the U.S. theatrical version, we start off with a, uh, a red font scrawl over a black background, which gives us an idea of uh, how the balance of light and dark are necessary for the world to exist okay i'm gonna stop you right there sure because i don't want to go into too fine detail about everything but i want to express my displeasure of exposition word crawls why i just don't you hate star wars well here's the thing okay i feel like with star star wars it was very huh star fox I, i couldn't play that game it gave me motion sickness Um, with Star Wars, it kind of became its kind of niche thing and people accept it whether they like it or not, because it is Star Wars. I think that's why I give it a pass with Star Wars. But outside of that, I don't like exposition dump word crawls, especially because, and you can correct me with this later in the movie if it comes in. I think this exposition crawl was the only place that we find the detail that it's only the purest of souls, such as Jack that can can find unicorns, right? Which yeah. means that if you don't follow the word scroll, if or scroll, if you crawl, Jesus Christ, this is not a good start. If you don't follow the word crawl, you'll miss that, and it's kind of important to the plot as we go forward. And at the same time, a red word crawl on a back black background is not a good idea. I thought it worked very well. I, I think see, here's the thing, okay? The next scene that we have is what? Uh, Goblin Blix. Talking to Darkness, right? Yes. And before Where Darkness convinces, uh, instructs Blix to go kill the unicorns. So before he instructs Blix to go and kill unicorns, he does this like monologue to no one. Soliloquy, yeah. Yeah. It's great. And... I feel like they could have used that part to give a little bit more narration into the details that you would get in the word crawl anyway. Maybe. Then I think it would get too wordy. I mean, and it already it, felt wordy to me. I didn't like yeah, the I didn't like the soliloquy to begin the movie anyway. Is. Oh my god, you suck, man. Okay. I mean, I'll I'll tell you why, okay? <laughs> No, that's fine. I'll tell you why, okay? Hold on. Yeah. In the version that we watched, Mm -hmm. we don't see darkness in that form again until 59 minutes into the movie. That doesn't sound right. Yep. You see him as a cloaked figure later when he's talking to the goblins. But you, you, you don't see him in this form... Aside from the fact that he's red at that point, where here he's like a blue because he's kind of hidden in the shadows. In shadows with green eyes and claws. 
That's not until 59 minutes later do you see him again. It almost would have been better if it was just his voice narrating if you wanted to keep that mystique of what he looked like until later. I think in other versions of the movie he shows up earlier in that form. But in this version, it's not until the 59th minute that we see him again in that physical form. Honestly, it's uh, at that point in, I believe, the director's cut where you actually you first see him before he's just a voice or a hand. But you don't see like his face or anything until much later. Well, then I have to agree with the director on that one because I think it would have been a lot better mystique-wise to have that scene where he appears be much more grandiose because it's the first time you're seeing this imposing large figure. Whereas at yeah. the beginning, he's just sitting there soliloquying and it's like, okay, well, this isn't going to get me into the movie. Yeah, well, you know why they do things like that, right? Because he is their marketing tool. And if you go in expecting to see this character and you don't see them until an hour into the film, you're going to feel ripped off and you're going to feel angry. Yeah, but I mean, like, it would have just felt more impactful in my opinion. And I guess... It does come down to the almighty dollar. Exactly. And I'm with you, man. I'm with you 100%. If they didn't have to worry about ticket sales, um, keeping him hidden in the shadows and having the big reveal happen later in the film is a fantastic way to uh, fully impact uh, your villain's present with that punch of that crazy, like, massive head, like, the large horns, the, like, the huge shoulder build, everything, like, then you like before you know that he's a an entity that's going to cause a lot of mayhem, but then you actually see him and you're terrified. And I will I say think that this: would be great. I will say this: if you're in a situation where you don't show him in a physical form, Tim Curry is absolutely an amazing actor who could carry it with just his voice until then. Yeah, he, like he is so good that you wouldn't need to see him until later, and you would still get like a sense of power from his voice yes, um agreed can i bring up my first nitpick i don't know if we have a counter or something going here but well we're at the very beginning of the movie so go for it <laughs> well i didn't want to get into it too early um in this scene blix says what do they look like lord to which you know the darkness stabs him in the head and you know it makes it i don't know maybe tongue-in-cheek humor on explaining it to him yes do they not know what horses are? Well, he, you don't see any other horses. Could he not just say a horse with a horn? Uh, well, I'm saying you don't see any other horses, so maybe they don't. I know that later in the movie, when the goblins see the unicorns, um, they do call them, or they do say, the ugly, the ugly one... One-horned mule. Yes, thank you. So, like, they know what mules are. I have to assume they would know what horses are. Maybe. All right, that's, that's it. making assumptions in a fantasy world. Dude, it's a nitpick. But I mean, okay, if there's mules, there's got to be horses. Maybe. All right, all right. Well, moving forward, he tells him to go kill the unicorn. Yeah, and bring the horns. Yes. Which hold the ultimate power, I guess. Uh, they they keep the light, in, the light in, in check, which keeps him at bay. Yes, exactly. Uh, a nice... Um, a nice cut, though, from the darkness going right to Lily running through the forest, which I have to say, like, I really like the way this film shot. Uh, all the forest scenes I find beautiful. Visually, this movie is top notch, but I feel like that is the crutch that it like it that it stands on. Like um, in this first scene, you see her running through the forest, right? She goes into the cabin with Nell. And before Nell arrives, she has this, like, vision in the house on the clock where it kind of, like, frosts over. And you see, like, the goblin chasing the... Or, I don't know if it's meant to be more like the darkness chasing it. Like, it's a little bit of a foreshadowing there, right? What, the the clock that's the life or death clock? Where you've got life heading through the cuckoo clock doors first and then the death figure following after? Yeah, I took it more like darkness chasing her, right? Yeah, it's life and death. Yeah. Right? Which is the foreshadowing. Which, I don't know why she had that vision. I don't know if she has any powers in this or anything. But the idea is, the way they shoot the transitions from that darkness scene to the outside, to in the cottage, and then it darkens over when they do the, the snow, and then Nell walks in and, and like snaps back into light. Like All of these transitions are done so well, whether they're smooth progressions, whether they're quick cuts. 
Yeah. It's visually very appealing. It is, and they they managed to cram a lot into a small set, I find. Um, but even as uh, Lily's going into the uh, cabin, she uh, uh, drops the one end of the clothesline, and then Nell makes the mention about the fairies, and you're like, okay, so we are going deep, deep into fantasy storytelling here, which I thought was nice, is letting you know that there are other types of creatures out there without showing them to you immediately. Yeah, um, I, I, even, I think it would have been better if they used a creature that we don't see later in the movie. Like what? Well, like, I don't know, but, like, just say something, right? Like, we see a fairy later. Yeah, I know, but fairies are known to be, like, mischievous. And... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There, I will say that as much as the camera work and the visuals are fantastic in these scenes moving forward, mm -hmm. the audio is clearly off. Oh, is it? I didn't notice. From the dialogue? Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I this is one of the few things I looked up. They had so much issue with uh so many issues with i guess sound from one of the other sound stages they had to go and redub all of the audio uh dialogue for these early scenes oh that's right and I honestly before i looked that up i could tell because it really did feel like the voices were a little bit floaty above what the actors were actually like doing at the time mm -hmm. right not terribly it's not like they're well off it's not like you know you know anime sub the you know dub or anything like that but it, it just it it is a little off and it was kind of off-putting for me yeah no I, I can get that um i honestly missed that altogether I, I it wasn't really a problem for me i do remember reading it after the first viewing but uh, i thought it was okay like obviously it wasn't jarring enough for me to pick up on I mean, um, it's it's probably one of the only circumstances where I nitpick on things. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's it's it. It's not my the only type one. Of thing. <laughs> okay, no, all right. Anyway, never. so she, she sees Nell in the cabin, and then she walks out, and we to had find to find Jack. To find Jack. Now, I will say, this is my first instance of watching the movie where I'm like, "Wow, this music is epic." Yes, it is. But I had a huge issue with it. Of course, you did. Of course I did. Because it was far too epic for what was happening in the movie. She's walking from a cabin to the forest to find Jack. And there's this epic music playing. I think it's more so to, uh, to I, emphasize the, the surroundings. Maybe, but it just, to me, it was like off-putting. It's like this is amazing and it would complement emotional moments and there's some scenes later in the movie where i'll point that out as well oh yeah man but it's like it to me it was like this is amazing music but it's just used in the wrong places yeah because like just a scene walking into the forest doesn't need music this epic right i don't know it really helped me get lost in everything i will say this if we cut out the middle scene of meeting jack and her walking in the forest right now, she accidentally stumbles upon the unicorns. And that's like a big monumental moment because she's not meant to see unicorns. Because yeah, let's just write out the main character of the story. I'm not saying write him out, but like, <laughs> you know. If, you could though, man. You could. You could. But what I'm saying is like, even if like he sees her when she's already found the unicorns or however you want to rewrite it. Then maybe it'll be like, okay, wow, yes, seeing these unicorns, which they do have epic music again when they do see the unicorns for the first time. But yes. like, if now she saw them and she wasn't meant to be and it was some monumental moment, I'd be like, okay, it makes sense. But literally right now she's walking to find Jack who jumps out and scares her. And it's like, wh why? Why was the music so epic for that? Couldn't tell you. Okay. That's all I'm saying, man. That's all I'm saying. Um, the introduction of Jack, though, uh, we should say Mia Sarah plays uh, Lily and uh, Tom Cruise as uh, Jack. Uh, really strange role for him. I don't really, I don't really think he's ever done other fantasy films, has he? I know he's done sci-fi. I couldn't think of a fantasy. Yeah, same. Anyway, uh, we meet Jack, who I'm totally confused about. By the way, he obviously lives in the forest, but it, does he live with anybody? Where are his parents? But that's the other thing, too, is he's not, because, like, he's meeting all of the other wooden creatures, all the fairies and stuff for the first time. 
he's just a boy, but he's pure, so he sees... Like, are we supposed to believe that he has some sort of mystical powers to him as well? Like, I was curious about that, too. Like, um, the characters kept a little too ambiguous, I think. And that's why I said earlier, this movie is just a lot of questions. The whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, why is this? Who is this? Why is this? And the whole reason that you often get is just because move forward dummy right like i wanted some explanation um and speaking of moving forward yeah like this guy he's just an idiot oh my god you thought so too 100 percent. okay let me read to you the very next bullet point i have in my notes okay sure did not enjoy tom cruise seems like the director told him just stare around at nothing like a moron most of the time well, they actually had a lot more lines for Jack, but Tom Cruise thought that it was uh, he was speaking too much and it didn't really go with his character. So they actually cut his lines down, which is fine. He can be more silent, but there's so many times like somebody's talking and he's like grinning like an idiot and staring kind of past them, not at them. And it's so just you like say that Jack, the forest boy, is slightly wooden. <laughs> No. <laughs> I don't approve that dad joke at all. <laughs> but like, no, you know what I mean, right? Like you can be a silent character. This one just seems like he's like spaced out. There's yeah, totally. A, a lot of times, like when he first sees uh Lily in that scene, he's literally like it looks like he's staring over her head and just kind of grinning and it's like it's like you're trying to make it look like you're listening to her, but you're not listening to her. Right, like yeah, he's it's like off he just got back from hanging out with Marty from uh, Cabin in the Woods. Like he he he's acting like he's coming down off of a high. Yeah, and I found that a lot of this movie, I have to say, like Tom Cruise was probably my least favorite actor in this movie. Um, but at the same time, I think he actually fit the character because he, like, I not only did he play him like an idiot, but the character is an idiot. So I think he played it successfully. He had the look down for sure. I guess I'm like, I'm, I'm so torn on it because I I don't know if that's what he did or how he was meant to be. And if that's how he was meant to be, then Tom Cruise knocked it out of the park. As he always does, my friend. Yeah. And like this dialogue between the two of them is all get me started on that. And it all is... we have to establish is that they like each other. Yeah. But like, they don't just say they like each other. They're trying so hard to speak in a tone that fits fantasy and mystery and mysticism. And it's like, just just say what you want to say. Yeah. All right. Anyway, but so if you don't want to... on with his idiotic like behavior. Taking Willie to show her the unicorns, then getting angry because she is so in awe of them and goes up and touches one because she didn't even know they existed. Like, I don't really think he has the right to get mad at her for that. Okay. I have so many questions in this scene. Okay. (laughs) So many, like he takes them to a clearing and then like Tom Cruise is like pointing his hand out. Like, is he summoning them? And like, I believe so, but it doesn't like, it doesn't come off like he is. Uh, maybe no, he we're is. just left to assume that. Right? Yeah. And then we're like, okay, well, the goblins weren't able to get to the unicorns before, but like somehow just following to them now is adequate. And why didn't they follow Jack before? Has he never summoned them before? Like, why are we supposed to believe that a mortal touching them is bad? And is that what causes the poison dart to be able to, to hit the target? Or... Well, she- she was leading the goblins there the entire time she was going to find Jack. So, so, so what I don't assume is that they weren't they... able to follow Jack in the past. They're following, like, I'm actually literally trying to piece this together right now. Well, I don't know why they think that she's going to lead them to the unicorns anyway. Because we don't even know that. But they do, apparently. Somehow, I or, know. Or they know that Jack can find it, and what, they just assume he's going to eventually show her? If they know Jack, if they know Jack, coincidentally, is the day after or the day of darkness tells them to. Yeah, and if if they know Jack can find them, then why didn't they follow Jack before? These are questions. Yeah, and that's this is what I'm saying. So much of this movie, it's like 
I have to suspend disbelief a lot to just accept, yeah, okay, right? But like, really, I, I want, <laughs> like, I I don't know if it goes into more detail because I know that the director's cut is substantially longer than the 89-minute American theatrical version we watched. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it does give you more explanation on what's going on, in which case I think it would drastically change my view on the movie. But I only watched this version because this is one we were going to watch. And I mean, it is the one that American audiences got when it came out. So yeah. these are fair questions that people would have had when they saw the movie. Um, and the other funny thing is like <laughs> right away I saw like one of the horses when they like bow their head, the horn just like bounces like it's, it's cool. made of rubber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a problem throughout this film, not just with the unicorns. Mm -hmm. um, I did find one thing really intense and heartbreaking in this scene though is after she touches the the stallion unicorn and it runs off after it gets hit by the dart mm -hmm. um where it's succumbing to the poison do you remember that scene i mean i i remember that the like weather starts to change um well it's it's like all of the blossoms are falling off the tree all the pink and white blossoms yeah uh, i want to say look like uh apple blossoms or cherry blossoms uh set to tangerine dreams music uh i thought was a stunning shot see this is what i'm talking about this is where like the music was amazing and it fit walking in a field is not one of these situations that you need that and i did notice this because when the horse or unicorn gets its horn cut off and is presumably dead that's when like the eternal winter hits right yeah but when it's poisoned they like i i remember all these blossom petals falling and it's almost like okay we're transitioning from from summer to winter we can't do that without fall and that's representative of the horse i guess unicorn i'm gonna keep saying that whatever like losing its power and dying and it adds more impact and and like a feeling of how much of a loss this is gonna be yeah and then yeah, when definitely and then when they cut the horn off that's when it freezes over so like you can see, like, okay, yes, the weather is very directly tied to this, which, um, you know, the weather changes. So Jack is, of course, underwater and has to break through glass or gra uh, ice. Yep. Which, can we and talk about we... that for a second? Yeah, sure. What is she doing? I will marry whoever finds this ring, throws it off a cliff, and then is like... Like, when Jack jumps, she's like, Jack, no! It's like, what, the, what did well, you think was going to happen? Obviously, she was expecting him to go for it. Just probably not immediately and from that height. And, like, if He's she... an idiot. We've established this. Yes, he is. But if they love each other, just give him the ring. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, keep in mind, we don't know anything about either of these people. I get it, but, like... <laughs> like, she's obviously from some nobility. And he's running around the forest wearing briefs and a tunic. Would, like, would you like I to? Don't, <laughs> I, don't, you... I don't. I'm like, great, guys. You kids, you do your thing. Just, I don't need to know any more about either of you. My note for this scene is B-word tease. <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Just, if you, if you guys love each other, just give them the ring. Yeah. So anyway, he he falls through, or he breaks through the ice, and then uh, she does kind of like the thing you would expect, fight, fight or flight, and runs back to the cabin where Nell is frozen. However, as she's running back towards the cabin is another example of how the sets are amazing. When you've got like the tree branches falling, and, and they really nailed like that snow-covered fantasy um, set piece. Uh, looked beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Oh yeah, Absolutely. And then we get there, and we see that Nell is frozen. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Not me. Right? Like, I got the feeling like that was supposed to be impactful. For her, yes. For her. And, like, I feel like the audience is supposed to get that based on her reaction to it. But it's like, we saw her for one scene. Who cares? I don't. I, I really don't. Right? Like, mm -hmm. in this movie, and this was one of the things that I... I Forgot to look up, but like I saw that there was some speculation between if she was just a maiden or a princess or someone, right? Yeah. So it's like, who is this Nell to her? What is this town? Why does she care, right? Like, 
Is this like an adoptive parent? I, I don't know. I don't care. I don't like let her freeze. I don't care. <laughs> what? Did that sound heartless? <laughs> no, not at all. Like this not is at all. This is why I get back to the like, give me some information. Don't just give me questions. I want answers. Sandry Lukenic, fantasy cop. <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> you know me. Fantasy is one of my favorites. Like, you, you that's, why I, that's why I recommended this movie. You met me working in a fiction department at a bookstore. <laughs> like, I love fantasy. But I want some, some reasoning, some explanation. Not all. It doesn't have to be like some things can be mysterious. They just shouldn't all be mysterious. Yeah. What yeah. do you got for this scene? For the frozen uh, cabin? Yeah, because this is where the uh, goblins then break in and, and she is going to make her escape, I guess. Yeah, it was kind of cool to see them using the power of the alicorn, although I don't know why they call it the alicorn. Yeah, because that's a unicorn with wings and it's just a horn. Is it? Oh, wait. No, it says here a unicorn horn, also known as an alicorn, is a oh. legendary object whose reality was accepted in Europe and Asia from the earliest recorded times. Did I make the mix this up then? Yeah, it's probably. It's very likely. Whatever. I'll tell you what stood out the most for this scene for me. This was the second time we hear Blix talking in rhyme. Yeah. And that's already where I was like, this is going to get really annoying. And it does. Yeah. And it's only Blix, and not every time he talks. Just certain things he says are in rhymes. Yeah. That's all. That's my note. Okay. All right, so she escapes. Nothing more to say there. And this is where we find um, Jack has fallen asleep in the snow. And he's awoken by uh, Una the fairy. And he meets Gump. Or Frankie Munez. Yeah, the likeness is uncanny, really. I will say this. As much as he looks like Frankie Munez, his voice does not seem to fit him at all. Because it's not his. It's not? Whose is it? It's uh, Alice Platon, the same person that voiced Blix. Really? Yeah, they used his voice, but uh, they were afraid it sounded too Germanic. Um, so they got uh, Alice Platon to uh, dub his voice. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Okay. And if you listen to it, you can hear they sound very similar. Oh, I probably won't, but that's interesting. Oh, well, great then. <laughs> um, This scene. Okay. I like the scene. Okay, you go first then. You tell me why. I like Gump as a character. Mm -hmm. uh, the introduction of Una as the shining light just flying around is awesome. Uh, the dwarves. Well, we only really get to meet two of them. There's there's more than two there, but we get Screwball and Brown Tom. Uh, Brown Tom, which I honestly kept thinking they were saying Rum Tom. The entire time until maybe a little bit later into the movie. Uh, Brad is absolutely hilarious. He He's is probably one of my favorite characters in the movie. He is the top comedic character in this. Oh, yeah. And then you got Screwball. Played by Billy Barty. I hate him so much. <laughs> Why? Uh, what? You don't you didn't pick up on it? Did that voice not just shatter your soul? Nah. You didn't recognize his voice? No, I clearly missed something. What? What? He's Gwildor from the Masters of the Universe movie. Oh, I haven't seen that, so I don't know. Oh my god. I was the biggest He-Man fan growing up in the 80s, man. And when I heard that they were actually releasing a live-action movie, I lost it. I was so excited. Because I wanted to see the character of Orko. You know, the little flying wizard? Yep. Guess what? Orko's not in that fucking movie. Gwildor <laughs> is. And uh, who's Gwildor? I don't know. They just made him up for the film. <laughs> See, in the 80s, I was all about uh, Thundercats until I got into Ninja Turtles. I didn't really get into the He-Man, but... All right. Can I, anyway. tell you, can I tell you my thoughts on this scene? Sure. One, I found it odd that Jack was asleep. I'm thinking yeah. he passed out because of the snow. I don't think he decided, eh, you know, Lily's off in the wild and the unicorn's been killed time to take a snooze so i let that go what i didn't like was how quickly gump changed his view on what had happened 
Oh first, yeah. <laughs> first of all, he says, "I know everything," but not what happened today. So, so yeah, why did you say everything. you? So why did you say you know everything? <laughs> just to follow it with that, you don't know what happened here. You're a child of the forest, Jack. Yeah. So like that, whatever. But then he goes on to be like, "You can't go unpunished." And Jack says, "Well, it was for love. We didn't mean no harm." And then he's just like, "Oh, it's for love. Let's have a toast. Great. Get the wine yeah. out." It's like, "Let's I, get drunk." Yeah, your your um your view of the severity of this changed drastically for what seems like no reason at all. Well, he's just craving that elderberry wine that Brown Tom keeps in a bottle under his hat. So he needed an excuse to drink it. I don't yep. know, man. That was weird to me. That 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 <laughs> found felt really odd. But beyond that, then, yeah, then they were like, what, let's go find the other unicorn? Yeah, which is one of the saddest scenes to me. Uh, um, yes, but again, I, actually, I had an issue with the music in this scene. See, I love the music in the scene. And I actually watched this scene in the director's cut as well. And I was like, screw you, Ridley Scott. Your version with Goldsmith sucks in this scene. Um, I love the music. I felt that it seemed a little too cheerful for finding a fallen unicorn. Like uh, it, it, I think it's, it's supposed to be emotional. I didn't find it cheerful at all. Like I found that that music would be more of what you would have in say a hope spot, right? Like it was I, it was a little I bit, don't know if you understand music. Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. I that's that's when they are just banging spoons against the tree, right? That's the sound. That's uh, never music. Mind. You got it. You got it. Sorry for having an opinion on what I hear. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll try not to do that anymore. Yeah. I find it surprising you thought that was a little too happy or hopeful. Yeah, like the I music didn't feel somber enough. Like it was it was a little bit more like toned down. It was a little bit like slower paced, but it did seem to have like a little bit too much of a cheeriness to it. Hmm. I didn't get that. I'll have to go back and check it out. Fair. It's a perception thing, right? So um, so this is where they decide that they need a champion to go and save Lily. And Una takes Jack to get weapons because they decide he's going to be the hero. Okay. I, I have a bullet point note for this. Okay. I'd love to hear and it. I, I think this sums it up perfectly. Una leads Jack to the armor and weapons and gets creepy as fuck. <laughs> I swear, when she's like, it's our secret, I'm like, what is? <laughs> yeah, why are you seducing him? What is your secret? At first, I'm like, is it that her name is Una? And then later on, I realized it's like, oh, it's that she can shapeshift into a larger size and she's not just a little fairy. But like, And why is she keeping that a secret? And why does she give him, like... Okay, you can't run around pantsless in a tunic in the forest if you're going to go fight. So here's this fancy special armor that also doesn't have pants. Yeah, it doesn't cover his legs whatsoever. Like, that's cool. Like, let's just hope they don't aim down. Or maybe she just wants to see some more of that shaven leg that he's got showing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible. I don't Absolutely know. Absolutely terrible. I don't know. I did like that armor, though, man. It did look nice, but it needed a bottom half. Yeah, Even well, it was if, made out of flattened bottle caps. Yes, I, I think I read that in the IMDb yeah. uh, trivia section, which is actually uh, pretty impressive that they were able to do that with flattened bottle caps. But it like, is. I went back and looked at it, and yeah, you can tell when you know that's exactly what it is, but it looks great. Even if it, like, was still the same skirt style, but, like, went a little lower so it wasn't short shorts. Yeah. Right? It was just, it that made it look off to me, because it's like you got this awesome grandiose looking piece of armor and it just ends it's like okay cool you got a shirt right. yeah he really needed pants of some sort man or even just like shorts that went down to his knees because the first time when he jumped off that bridge when he was going for the ring i was like is his dick out <laughs> <laughs> am i stereotyping too much if i say a for a boy of the forest should probably be wearing tights isn't that what they wear in 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 fantasies i thought so usually or like some sort of cloak some sort of covering, but you know, I don't right. know. So never been. We move forward, okay? They leave. Uh, they leave Brown Tom to guard the unicorn. Yeah, which is another bunch of questions I have, but we'll get back to that. <laughs> we get a short interlude, interlude scene where the goblins are talking about essentially 
usurping darkness because they have the power of the horn. And I found that very strange. I found it strange, but there's one part that I had to rewind multiple times, and I don't know if you caught it or if this is just going to cause a question that you're going to want to go back and look at, and maybe even the people that are listening to. Mm -hmm. When darkness sees what they're doing and then goes to throw the one into the pit, right? Or jump into the prison or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Where he's throwing the wand. You mean the no the, the one um so oh, yeah yeah darkness yeah, gets there and he summons a creature to come up and he grabs the one that's actually like a uh like a, a goblin in or a dwarf in disguise or whatever but we don't see that at this time because he's just wearing yeah, it looks form. like one of the uh, guys from guar yeah i don't remember what character that name is but like he grabs him and then jumps down the pit right leaving blix and the other one right mm -hmm. somebody says adios amigos I didn't catch, like, I rewound so many times to see what character's voice that matches up with. And I, I couldn't find a match. I don't know. And then at the same time, I'm like, this seems like a really weird spot to just throw in an adios amigos. Yeah, the, the, the humor in this movie is very strange. It almost feels like somebody off camera was just like, ha, adios amigos. And they're like. Oh, let's just keep that in there. That was gold. Good job, man. Yeah, it's weird. It, it's... It, it had no place being there. Yeah. And then we come back to another scene that really bothered me. <laughs> and are we, we're talking like outside of the darkness and the goblin scene? Yeah. So after that, well, which I is... actually want to bring one thing up before we leave that scene. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, where darkness is making sure that both unicorns had been killed and they assure him that, yeah, they are. And then he's like, then why is Dawn? Or why is there Dawn? Mm -hmm. uh, and then saying that they killed the stallion, but the one left alive is just a female. She has no power. And his response is only the power of creation. Wonderful line. Perfect. Wonderful line. Perfect. And then they cut from there. I'm like, that's, that just gave that entire scene power. Yes. So what's the next yeah. scene? Brown Tom being hilarious? Yes, but it starts with Lily finding them, right? Yeah. And then the goblins show up. How? I don't know. They were just talking to Darkness. They clearly yeah. weren't following Lily to begin with. Unicorns are not supposed to be easy to find. So how did yeah, they just I'm sure, find... I'm sure that this is something that was lost in the edit to shorten the film because like you said originally we are watching the shortest of the three versions but i mean somebody editing this version must have thought that's good enough mm -hmm. which it's not <laughs> like, i never even thought about it until you brought it up though so maybe it is for some people because if if we if we look at it in the version that we got it cuts from them talking to darkness to lily approaching the unicorn unicorns are not supposed to be easy to find only found by the purest of souls like Jack. Maybe the fact well, that she... they're easier to find than horses. Exactly. But then, like, the goblins just show up. And it's like, how? Like, why couldn't know, this have all just happened before? I don't understand. But you were, you were approaching this in the proper way of, like, making sure the story made sense. Uh, making sure there aren't any weird loopholes or anything. I kept getting lost in it. So I feel like I just kind of went with what they were showing me. And I think that's a sign of good filmmaking. It really worked for me in this. But yeah, now that you're bringing up points like this, there are a lot of questions. See, raised. here's the thing. There's a lot of movies that I've seen where this type of stuff happens, but not at the same frequency. So you can let it go a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least there's even some flashbacks or offhand comments, right? Like just to indicate that this is how, right? Yeah. Like when... This is jumping a little bit ahead, but when Jack comes back and they're going to follow the goblins, they say, we'll follow their tracks in the snow. Good enough. Right? Yes. You don't need much more than that. Even if you said, like, we can track the poison dart, something, right? Like, but it's just, it's hard to suspend disbelief. But going back to this scene, this is where Brown Tom probably is at his highlight. Yeah, where he takes the, uh, well, he's like deflecting all of their shots. Well, the until the one that kills him. Right in the head. Yeah. Well. So we're led to believe. We're led to believe. 
But I mean, that's wonderful. And it ties in so well with when, right, they take Lily and the unicorn and then Jack comes back and he's like, yeah. oh, she was alive before they killed me. And it's like, you're, you're talking. You're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> they killed you too? Yeah, you're still, like, you're telling us this story. <laughs> um, it, it, oh, Brown Tom's great. Any scene he's in will make me laugh for the most part. I don't have much more to say about that. I don't know if you want to move forward then. I, I do because I'd love to talk about the next scene for two reasons. Okay. Uh, one, an offhand comment that Screwball makes. Okay. And two, the wonderful creation that is Meg Mucklebones. Okay. So as they're crossing a swamp, nobody wants to cross it. They convince Screwball that he has to go first. And he as he's climbing up the tree to cross he, well let's just say it was gump that made him go first as he's walking away he just offhandedly offhandedly calls him a foreigner and keeps going <laughs> i i don't understand why that was included at all but i loved it it just honestly i think it's because it's gwildor and i hate him already so let's make me hate him more but then you also have like he gets to the other side and he's like, made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens in a movie when you say something like that? Uh, falls right in. It falls right in. Right. Immediately right after. And then you find out that he's actually attacked by a creature in the swamp who then spits him out because they hate the taste of fairies. <laughs> And this is our introduction to a swamp hag called Meg Mucklebones. What a shame. Played by the amazing Robert Picardo. What a shame. This character, practical effects, amazing. looks so good. So good. But it's Some of the best I've ever seen. In relation to the length of the movie, we get it for five minutes, not even? No, not even five. I'd not say even, two. Not even five minutes. This awesome no. looking character... The fight with her lasts nothing. Like there's, he holds his shield up and asks her like if if she's gonna eat him, of course or whatever, and then he cuts her head off, and that's it. Like just like a like a speck on the radar. Like why would you go into the effort of making a character like this, making it look awesome, giving it a good amount of personality, considering the limited time that it was on camera? And then yeah. just be done with it. Well, you had mentioned that to me before. So I looked into it and I did watch the scene in the director's cut. And it is a fair bit longer. Um, there is no extra action, though. Um, action that you see in the U.S. Uh, version is the action you see in the director's cut. It's just there's more back and forth between Jack and Meg as he's trying to distract her by telling her how beautiful she is and how he's no good enough not good enough as a meal for her um but yeah it's as far as action goes same thing it's just hit with the uh shield one swing of the sword and she's decapitated it feels like such a throwaway scene like it honestly feels like they're like oh it's gonna be too long between action scenes we gotta put something in here let's pad yeah. it a bit how many children do you think that scene terrorized <sighs> all of them yeah, right? Almost every child that ever watched that movie is probably terrified by the Meg Mucklebones character. I wouldn't have wanted to see it as a kid. No, me <laughs> Not either. at all. <laughs> so then we have the shame of moving away from that because it was yeah. awesome and it's over. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I, um, I, I feel bad for saying this, but for the most part, from here on out, it, it's almost uh, like a paint-by-number, like straightforward action denouement after the climax yeah Did you find it, that too yeah it happens very quickly now yeah although i do have to say um when we leave the swamp and go back to the uh weird tree castle um the introduction to that underground prison cell yeah is horrific yeah it's like a guy actually Maybe I'm mixing this up with the first oh, time. Oh, I'm mixing see it up too. The first time you see it at the beginning with there's uh, a guy butchering a person, right? Or and he's just creature. hacking at his yeah. arm with a giant blade. In my mind, I'm like, was this a movie for kids? 
I, I honestly, didn't know, man. I always thought it was. I honestly didn't know. I saw that, and I'm like, this isn't very kid-friendly. No, it's not at all. And I mean, I, I even went as far as to look it up and was like, oh, the movie was PG. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, also keep in mind, PG-13 or adult or like A-14 or 14A didn't exist at the time. Fair, fair. So it went from general to PG to R. Okay, yeah. In that case, I could see how, yeah, there there isn't yeah. that middle step for it to take, which it probably would have had that existed. Yeah, it's definitely dark. But the prison um, but looked like, good. It looked great. Which, I, see, see, which seems, I didn't understand. Seems to be a common thing uh, we've been saying, is that like there isn't a single scene from a visual standpoint that isn't done well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's great. I actually, um, it, I have very little listed in the prison scene, so I don't know if you okay. want to take over for this yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I did find it very unsettling that they're cooking and eating the prisoners. Yep. Uh, that's something else I found went really dark for this film. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the look of the cooks, uh, like pig ogre things, kind of reminded me of uh, the the pig alien from uh, the beginning of Return of the Jedi that ends up being eaten at the beginning at uh, Jabba's flying ship thing. I forget, you know, that giant monster in the uh, in the pit. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I'm doing a horrible job describing it. Sarlacc I, pit? I hate, that. I hate that movie. No, not the Sarlacc pit, man. Nope. Uh, it's at the beginning when they're going to rescue uh, uh, Han and Chewie. Yeah, whatever. We're not yeah, okay, about anyway. that movie now. That's fine. Anyway, pig. Um, yeah, no, and yeah, that that's pretty much where you find out that the uh, the goblin that got thrown down the the pit, who's still alive, is actually uh, one of the uh, I guess a fairy. They keep referring to them as fairies, but I don't see them as fairies like Screwball and Brown Tom. Yeah, I don't know what they are. I had trouble trying to label them earlier too. Yeah, um, but no, they've got their uh, escape when uh, they get Una to fly and find the key after they. This is the perch. only thing I have notes on for this scene. Okay, then take it away. Bake them away, toys. She shows up and is pissed off that Jack is gonna ruin her secret. Yep. Which again, she's already in that more human form so i'm not sure if that was the secret or not creepy af but yeah gets really creepy and says i'll help you guys escape for a kiss he doesn't really kiss her he gives her the peck and then they're like well that's not really a kiss and she turns into lily and he's like no that's not how human hearts work and in my mind i'm like just kiss her man like what 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 are you doing right yeah, I'd be like, I'm a, I am so uncomfortable right now. Just, just fucking do it, Jack. Yeah, just go, Jack. But then when he doesn't, she does it anyway. Yep. <laughs> She's like, kiss me, and I'll get you guys out. Oh, you didn't kiss me? I'll get you guys out. Yeah. So like, you were gonna do it all along. You just wanted to take an opportunity to creep on him a little more. Okay. I don't know, man. It doesn't fit in this movie. Nope. Like, I'm glad it's there because we're talking about it and how ridiculous it is. But I don't understand what it gives to the rest of the story. Okay. So I think this is a perfect transition, though. To one of my favorite scenes? Well, it goes to the scene where Darkness is talking about how he's never felt desire like this before for Lily. Okay, yes. Almost one of my favorite scenes. Continue. So it's a good transition because for some reason we have Una inexplicably, like, thirsting over Jack. Then yes. we go to a scene where Darkness just wants to bang Lily or something. Yeah, it's it's weird. And like it's real weird. The voice that he's talking to, I don't know, is that supposed to be like a a guardian, a parent? I don't know who it was. I don't remember. Or if he was talking to himself, says that you only desire her because she's pure. I don't know if that somehow to him makes her more desirable, like the opposites attract or whatever. Well, it's all about the balance again, right? Yeah. It may be about balance, but it is a little creepy. Before we move forward, let's just hear a quick message from one of our friends. 
Knights and Nerds is not just an actual play D&D podcast with an original campaign being played by a group of friends who tolerate each other. It's also a podcast where I, the Dungeon Master, talk about how I'm adapting to the choices the players make, as well as revealing to you, the audience, the complex story and deadly twists that I have in store for my players. Find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or at knightsandnerds.com. And this is where Darkness is told that he has to woo Lily, uh, which leads to one of my favorite scenes, uh, the dance with the gown. It was definitely visually stunning. It was pretty uh, weird, though. It was very weird. What was, like... At first, I'm like, is that a creature in the gown? Yeah, same. Um, it, it had a very weird tim burton look to it um but i thought the choreography was amazing as well as again tangerine dream score the music really really worked with it right to the point where they combine into lily wearing the gown that she was just dancing with i thought it was fantastic visually stunning scene fantastic choreography and the music is fantastic and it's quite frankly a very good summary of what this movie was to me there's a lot of very nice visual stuff mm-hmm. with no explanation storyline why any of it is happening it's like a well, running at point, theme at this point you just assume that it's the magic of darkness well yeah but i mean again like because that is his attempt to seduce her yeah it's a weird one getting a, oh yeah Dan- like a dress to dance by itself towards her, but okay. Mm-hmm. But then... I don't know, but then his entrance is what I think you want to talk about? This is where I think if they had kept him even as a cloaked figure for the previous scenes, right? Yes. Like, yep. Even if in the initial scene where he's um, doing his little monologue, if he did it as the cloaked figure... If you had to have him rather than a dismembered voice, Mm -hmm. right? You could have done that. Like you did it when he was talking to the goblins, right? So up until now, if you had done just cloaked and as he comes through the mirror and first it's his hand and then a hoof, that is so awesome that if you hadn't seen the character prior to it, you would have just been floored at that point. Oh, yeah. No, it is an amazing scene. Uh, what an introduction that would have been, too. Um, I do have a problem with it, though, in that it is a, it's a great idea, but it was limited to the effects of the time, and the effects really don't hold up well. No, but I mean, we're we're taking into account, right, what we had in front of us, right? I know, but like it, it's almost jarringly bad. It is pretty bad. Like, I get that they're trying to make it look like it comes out of the mirror, but it really just does look like the the film reel splits where that yeah. is, right? Like, it's not yeah. done well. Absolutely amazing idea, though. Yes. And that's why I think that by showing him just the one time prior in that form takes away from it. Because you could have had him cloaked. Tim Curry, who is... But far and beyond the best actor in this movie could have carried all of that dialogue with just the voice at this moment could have then given you the shock factor the big oomph the big reveal that really would have just put a stamp on this movie yeah i think they felt that they could get away with using the same uh footage though because this is the first time that lily sees him i believe yes yeah yeah so there is the shock for the character, just not for the audience, unfortunately. Yeah, but I think if they put those together and let the audience feel that shock at the same time, that's mm-hmm. when it would have been like, wow, right? I do have to say, I find it very strange how she keeps all of her factors together after she passes out. She wakes up and already has a plan that she's going to free the unicorn by asking to kill it okay can i read you my note for this sure darkness is a moron for believing lily changed her mind so easily 
Agreed. It's like, the balance. The moronic the, darkness and the idiot Jack. Like, in the exact same conversation, he's like, have a drink. No, I'll do nothing for your pleasures. Like, there isn't even, like, a period of time where she's held captive, or he does a little bit more convincing, or he yep. does further seduction. It's literally, like, approach, rejection, approach, rejection, approach, okay, let me kill the uh, a unicorn. It's like, why are you so dumb? Yeah, he's pretty dumb. Luckily for us, it transitions to Jack coming up with a plan almost just as quickly. <laughs> When and they like, find out that uh, daylight will will kill the darkness. And luckily, Jack has the foresight to know that the kitchen has all these giant reflective plates that they can use to bounce the sunlight. Because he doesn't even tell his allies why they're gathering them at first. But he knows. <laughs> and then and then they're like, okay, we need to take one up to the top of this. I don't know what it was, like a chimney or... Yeah, that's what I thought, like a vent of some sort. A vent of some sort. He's like, one of us needs to take it up there. Sure, direct the first bit, right? Yep. In my mind, I'm like, why doesn't Una just fly it up there? Yep. Which I guess they kind of explain later, but not in a good way? No, not at all in a good way. I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but when they put their plan into action, they tell her, like, fly up and I guess give the signal. Because... Why they couldn't set up the first plate and have the one at the bottom that reflects be the one that they put up when they need to is beyond me, but whatever. And it shows that she can't pick up the plate. She has to revive... I think It's Brown Tom that goes up there, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, she has to revive him because she can't pick up the plate. And it's like, you're a fairy. Use magic. What? Yeah, use the power of your creepiness. And, and honestly, I know that I kind of jumped ahead in this. And it makes it feel very quick. But I really do feel from this point on, which is like the final 15-ish minutes. Yeah. It goes by so quickly. Oh, yeah. They're in a rush to get the movie over and done with, it feels like. They get their plan. They head to the point where they're going to ex like expend their plan. And they have a little bit of combat. Very quick in passing. Yep. They get to a vantage point where they see Lily is about to kill the unicorn and Gump is just telling Jack to kill her. Um, but, like, that happens so quickly. Yeah. So but, quickly. You know, Jack refuses. He trusts her. Which is a and callback then... to an earlier scene. Like, when they're first talking, he does say, or, like, she asks him, do you trust me? And he says, always. So at least that was nice that... For one point in this movie, they did add some, you know, forethought and explanation as to why he is trusting her. Yes. Um, but, but again... he in turn then fires an arrow into the neck of darkness. Yep. While she swings and breaks the chain that is holding the unicorn, which... That is a strong sword if she's able to break a chain with it. One swing. Yeah. She does look pretty physically imposing, though, so I guess she's got a lot of oomph behind that one swing. That's true. Um, and then we get to the final confrontation between Jack and Darkness. Good well, and evil, light and darkness. Right before that, I want to go back to the arrow through the neck. Okay. Which, if you look closely, is still in going his one way and then exits on a completely different angle. I think when you cut back to Jack just after he releases the arrow, it's still notched in the bow as well. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's weird. It's just really bad special effects makeup. But to me, no, it also to me it also kind of screams that they were also rushing to get through the end. I mean, I know they don't film these movies in sequence of the events, yeah. but it really does feel like oh, this bit at the end is very thrown together haphazardously well it feels like they were doing the edit and then they realized we have to keep this at 89 minutes oh god and just did a hack job i mean you'd think that maybe they'd have some other takes or other footage they could use if they're editing already when mm. they come to this realization unless there was a one take type of group 
Could have been. I don't know. I don't Ridley know. Scott's a weird guy. But then we have the fight, I guess, with Darkness and Jack. Yeah, what do you think of that fight? Uh, it was all right. I mean, it was okay. It was probably the best, like, actual, like, hand to hand combat in the movie. But it did make me wonder how Jack, who is this reluctant, reluctant hero at the beginning, and even says he's not like a hero or adventurer or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what they say when they they needed us. A champion? A champion, thank you. And, like, but all of a sudden, he can go toe-to-toe with Darkness, and he's actually, you know, holding his own pretty well? Yeah. I don't know, man. I I, I don't like the way this ends. See, but that's um, why if you do the movie in a, in a better pacing and you have more action scenes prior to that, you can at least accept that he's learning as he goes. But, like... Yes. We jump back as much as we try not to jump back and forth to the Meg Mucklebones fight. Yeah. He swung the sword once and cut her head off. Yep. You're not like, oh, now he knows technique. No, he swung a sword once. At a waterlogged witch. Yeah. So, like, and again, there is a little bit more combat in the prison, uh, like the kitchen, which I think we actually glossed over. Yeah, Um, that was a good fight scene, though. But, like, none of that is enough to say that, like, now he can challenge Darkness himself. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's and then we... Jedi training. Yeah, and he, he wins because, like, the light weakens Darkness and he can... Uh, he ends up, what, cutting off the hand that holds the unicorn oh, horn? He stabs him in the gut first. Yeah, but, like, when he's... When he, I guess, delivers the final blow, it's it's... You don't actually yeah, he hacks at both hands. Yeah, he doesn't kill him. He hacks off his hands, which I mean, yeah, I don't think that's going to kill darkness. But okay, um, and and then we just go back to like them reviving the unicorn. Yeah. I uh, before we go any further though, I do want to say, um, you had mentioned the unicorn at the beginning, uh, how the horn was just wobbling. Yeah. Well looking at darkness doing his bull rush towards Jack and you saw those two giant horns just flopping around really killed the intensity for me. (laughs) I mean, I can see what they were going for because if they were, if they were solid, like it's such a good idea. It looks good, but it's not, it's not executed fantastically. (laughs) It's not executed well at all. Let alone fantastically. I was trying to be nice, man. (laughs) Um, but but then again, like we jump right from that to, I guess it's Jack waking up in the lake again with the ring. Yeah. Or no, 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 no. They they revive the unicorn first. No, no. This is it. It happens so quickly. I can't even remember the order of it. I thought they yeah, revived uh, the unicorn first because they take the horn back, and uh, that's only after uh, he gets Lily right because. He dives into the water again, gets the ring because he can't break the curse. It's a riddle only he can solve, he's told. So Gump takes the uh, alicorn and heads out. Jack gets the ring. And I feel like the unicorn is revived as uh, Lily is revived. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that's how they did it time-wise. But first of all, was all you had to do to bring the unicorn back was put its horn back against its head it's a good question my friend it's a and good question does that mean it was really dead if it wasn't dead why did the seasons change Damn. i think it was dead but okay so uh. <laughs> well really that's all they did to bring it back to life they didn't kill darkness or anything well they didn't kill darkness that's what i'm saying they just put the horn up against its forehead where the horn should have been and then boom it's back to life and, yeah. like, we even see it's back to life because in whatever order it happens, after Jack and Lily reunite in the scene that almost makes it, like, makes it feel like Lily thinks that she was dreaming the whole time type thing. Yeah. You see the unicorns and the, and, uh, a gump and, and the, I don't know, dwarfs, goblins, fairies, whatever, like, kind of wave at them, like, across a chasm, right? Yeah. And, and then we see the image of darkness laughing. Because yeah. there can be no, there can be no good without evil. 
It is an eternal struggle that will never be resolved. Yeah. And then the movie ends. That was uh, your stereotypical Hollywood ending, I think. And I would love to stress for anybody who did forego watching the movie before listening to us talk about it. The reason the ending sounds so rushed when we talked about it compared to the earlier parts is because that's how it comes off in the movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rough. So why don't you give us some of the deets on how this movie did? Uh, not good. No, I didn't. Not too well. I think I looked up the box office and the budget when I was going through for some other notes. Yeah, the estimated budget was twenty four point five million dollars. Um, worldwide gross fifteen point five million dollars. Oh, ouch! Yeah, uh, on IMDb for ratings, it's sitting at six point five out of ten. Rotten Tomatoes, the tomato meter has it rested at thirty eight percent, while the audience score is seventy three percent. So obviously, not critically acclaimed. Uh, much more of a, a cult film now. See, which I, I get. I, I don't get it, man. Unless it's just people that are high when they're watching it. Ah, uh, you didn't like this? Wait, before we do this, I do want to talk about the endings. Sure. Because we were talking about how the ending felt rushed. Yeah, go for it, man. Um, I actually did watch all three endings. <sighs> Poor guy. Um, yeah, well, no, man. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, so the US version that we saw is the typical all is not finished ending where you get... You know, the villain reappearing in some form here. We get, like, the uh, the laughter. Um, and then we see Jack and Lily running off into the sunset together. Uh, in the UK version, there's also a happy ending, but without the darkness part. So it's just, everything's great. They both run off into the sunset together. It almost feels kind of hollow. You're like, wow, there is like everything is cut and dried, said and done. Evil is vanquished. Let's ignore the entire theme of the movie. Everybody's happy. Wow. <laughs> then you get the director's cut, <laughs> which I would call the most realistic ending. Um, where the two realize that they don't fit in each other's lives. They have two completely different lifestyles. So they agree that they will just leave it at Lily will keep visiting Jack in the forest and they'll spend their days together, but ultimately will be apart. And then you only see Jack waving and running off into the the sunrise, sorry, uh, alone without Lily. I'm like, yep, that is perfect. That is the balance. We are right back to where the movie started. So what was the point? Maintaining the balance. Keeping that status quo, man. Okay. So of those three endings, though, what do you like more? Uh, Whatever one ends the movie faster. Wow, you hated this movie. I was not a fan. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what you... I guess you want my final thoughts on this now? Oh, I can talk more. I can talk about the... Uh, the soundtrack for a a short while if you want if you want yeah well obviously you don't like this but i really did man no i no 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 no. i like the soundtrack i no, no, i meant the movie oh okay and i find that the soundtrack is a, a big part of why i enjoyed the movie so much um because the tangerine dream soundtrack that or score that the u.s version got is not the original version. It was a Jerry Goldsmith uh, orchestral theme that they got in the UK. And uh, I, I just found that the Tangerine Dream synth soundtrack, synth score, um, felt much darker and it felt like it had a lower budget as opposed to a grandiose orchestral score, which people called timeless. And I think that was the problem with Goldsmith's music for me is that it is timeless. And while this film... Its story is timeless, good versus evil. Uh, The production itself is very much stuck in the 80s. A lot like the soundtrack from Tangerine Dream. And I just feel like if you've got an 80s look and an 80s sound, it's going to come across as more of a whole 
than if you have an 80s looking film with a score that sounds like it could be paired with any movie that comes out today. Um, now, and it could even just come down to what version of the movie you saw first. And maybe that's why I love the Tangerine Dream one, because I think this movie stuck with me from when I saw it, because I could just get lost listening to the soundtrack itself. But every time I try and check out a scene with Goldsmith's score, I it was just too jarring for me. Um, now, having said that, you know, everybody has their own choice, like some like Tangerine Dream, some like Jared Goldsmith. Uh, but I think everybody can agree that the Brian Ferry song used at the end is undeniably terrible. Are you waiting for me to say something back? Yeah. I think I made it pretty clear what I thought about the soundtrack is that I liked it. I just didn't like how they used it in the movie for the majority of it, where they put it in and how they matched it up with the um, weight of the scenes that they're using it for. Okay, I can see where you're coming from. I I disagree for the most part. I think it's used perfectly. Um, but, I mean, if it was used that well, maybe it would be much more available today. And the, uh, the CD you can uh, find on Amazon for uh, uh, a nice low, low price of $324. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, sir. <laughs> but no, you... Uh, right, let's... Uh, Let's skip Ridley Scott. He's done enough right now. Tom Cruise is Jack. What's your stance? Not not a good role. As I, I it's it's probably the worst movie that I've seen him in, or the worst performance that I've seen from him in a movie. Okay, I was gonna say you haven't seen a lot of his movies. I've seen and I've seen a lot worse. I thought he was fine in this movie, and you have to keep in mind the character of Jack is relatively nondescript, and I thought that. You know, that's perfect for Tom Cruise. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mia Sarah as Lily. I believe this is her first movie before she did uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, she was perfectly fine. I, yeah, I like I her too. I didn't have any complaints with her. I'm not going to, uh, you know, paint her as one of the positives of the movie. But, like, she, she, you know, she carried her weight and she did just fine. Yeah, she played the role well. Nothing, uh, nothing amazing, but... Far from poor. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Curry as Darkness. I don't think anybody would even talk about this movie at this point if it wasn't for Tim Curry and the soundtrack. Yeah, I think you're right. I definitely stole the show for as little time as he had on screen. Um, yeah, definitely iconic character in all of fantasy film, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, you see the imagery of that character quite often. Um, even just in parody, in... Uh, being incorporated as a, a baseline imagery in you know video games and commercials and ads and things like that but uh yeah of course but it's definitely tim curry's performance that elevates it yep uh david bennett as gump i have only seen him in this and he was just fine yeah just, literally if you ask me for the rest of the way they were all just fine brown tom had some humor but that yep. was also Cor a benefit Cor of Hubbard. Cork Hubbard's brown tom's great I will say that. He was one of my favorite characters. Yeah, but I think he also gets the benefit of being the one that the script gave the um, little bit more you know, humor to. Right. Yeah, but they also tried to give some humor to Screwball, but... Didn't land as well. Gwildor, you bastard. <laughs> Just get over it, man. It's in the past. I can't. They ruined it. And I think the only other thing I would say is that Meg Mucklebones was fantastically envisioned and terribly utilized. Yeah. Played perfectly by Robert Picardo. So that's all I really have to say about the cast myself. If there's any Wait, others you, you want don't to touch remember, on. You don't remember Robert Picardo? I, I guess you're looking for me to say something. Uh, yeah. Why haven't you learned yet, man? Did you ever watch any of the Star Trek series? Uh, I watched some of the original. Okay, yeah. Same, really. The original series is all I really cared about, but he was a uh, a very prominent role on uh, Voyager, the Doctor. Yeah, no, I didn't watch it, so I don't know. All right then, very good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's on you if you don't remember that I don't watch anything. So, understood. All right. So, closing thoughts then. 
Um, well, I think it's safe to say that I love this movie. Uh, yeah, it definitely has its flaws. Uh, that's called the director's cut. Um, but uh, it's it's a great a great time, man. It's a a lot of fun to watch. I uh, as far as acting goes, everyone works out pretty well. Um, there are some strengths, some weaknesses to the acting, but everybody plays their roles okay. Um, musically, I love it. Uh, storytelling, it's exactly what you'd expect from a mid '80s fantasy film. Um, set designs, fantastic. Special effects by Rob Bottin, who is one of the best of all time. Um, and it's really fun to see where some of these actors uh, came from in the early '80s. Like Tom Cruise hadn't really done a whole lot. Uh, Mia Sara had, I think, this is our first major film. Tim Curry had been around, but I think this really solidified him as a, a major, major player, a heavyweight in Hollywood. Well, I mean, he um, had already done Rocky Horror Picture Show before this. Yes, of course. And I don't know, I think Clue came out right before this, maybe shortly after. I'm not um, sure. But he'd been in everything. But this, I think, I don't think he had really done more f- any fantasy along this line. Mm-hmm. So, you know, well done, Tim Curry. Um, yeah, I, I recommend this movie. You definitely have to be forgiving in some areas. Honestly, if anybody who doesn't like fantasy watches this movie, I could see them hating it immediately. Um, but yeah, I, I would recommend. I really enjoy I did not enjoy it, and I would not recommend it. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say, man. You know my stance on this movie. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I know that you didn't like it. Um, there's no way I'm going to convince you otherwise. Uh, you don't have any unsound arguments. Uh, uh, it's just what worked for me didn't work for you. Let's just say this, okay? Two movies prior to this, Tom Cruise did risky business. The movie great he did, movie. the movie he did right after this was Top Gun. Also a great movie. Now are you saying that's the movie he he actually acted first and after, or they were released before and after? Uh, released before and after. There was one other one between Risky Business and this one, um, All the Right Moves. Oh, um, also good. But, but uh, not one of his more prominent roles. Sure it is. Sure. Because, uh, you know, when people talk about his list of movies, those are the one. that's the one that always comes up. All the right moves comes up all the time. Are you crazy? I never hear it. I hear people talk oh, about weird. Cocktail okay. and Top Gun, Days of Thunder. Um, I'm not saying All the Right Moves isn't a, a, a good one. but Tropic it's not, Thunder. Well, that's, that's way, way down there. I'm just talking about around this time when he was kind of breaking out still. And, yeah, uh, also Tropic Thunder is not a Tom Cruise movie. No, he's just in it yeah. uh, for a little bit. Um, no, but I was like, he, say, was, he was very well known for that movie in the 80s. Yeah, it kind of trailed off. You are really not going to let me finish this, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. Sorry, now now you can say. <laughs> I was just going to say, if I'm looking at the resume, I'm not looking at the movie between those two because it does not stack up. This movie is here for Tim Curry and for the soundtrack. And I think that you'd probably be better off just listening to the soundtrack harsh man is it is it really okay i'll add one more caveat if you are and and i'm gonna repeat the phrase that i used at the beginning of this uh episode if you are one of the fever dream acid tripping people that was behind making and watching this movie you'll probably like it perfect um so you know we agree once again on a movie sure let's go with that wah wah so what movie are we going to disagree on next week, Ben? Uh, well, next week I'm taking us back into the snowy depths of cinema history, and we'll be watching and talking about 1982's The Thing. discovered something for 100,000 years it was buried in the snow and ice 
Now it has found a place to live, inside, where no one can see it, or hear it, or feel it. I know I'm human. Some of you are still human. This thing doesn't want to show itself. It wants to hide inside an imitation. It'll fight if it has to, but it's vulnerable out in the open. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. You guys gonna listen to Gary? He can beat one of those things! I had a feeling this movie would show up at some point. I know you love it. I, I'm aware it has flaws, but I'm willing to discuss the strengths and, and weaknesses behind it. All right. Well, until next week, have a good one. All the best, guys.